you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. And given that assistants are typically, you know, if you hire from Eastern Europe, probably like six to eight dollars an hour, pretty sure everyone listening to this podcast, your time is worth more than six to eight dollars an hour. Hey friends, it's Steve. Wanna know how a $5 book lands a $5,000 client? I've recorded a 15 minute video showing you our magnetic author method. It's up now at magneticauthor.co slash video. Unstoppable CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Gordon, and today we got an amazing interview for you. Uh, we've got, I think, a topic that is probably the most important to virtually every business owner, and that's how do I build a team? And not just how do I build a team in general, but how do I build a team right now in the present environment where we've gone from you know, remote work being kind of a weird little side thing to being the way that most companies are are looking at the future. And so I've got an absolute expert in that uh, today. I'm talking uh, with Noel Andrews. And way back in 2018, he bought a company called Jobrack after 10 years of building and leading large teams in the, the corporate tech world. Since then, he's helped businesses all over the world hire more than 1,000 remote team members from Eastern Europe. And along the way, he's narrowly avoided burnout, which we all can deal with. He's built his own team and uh, recently published a, a book on digital delegation. So I'm excited to dive into this because delegation is always a challenge, I think, for business owners. And now that we're in this remote digital method of working, it's, I think, even more difficult sometimes to wrap your head around. So, Noel Andrews, welcome to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast. Excited to have you here. Hey, Steve. Really, really good to be here, too. So, you left corporate and you decided to jump in and become an entrepreneur and and focus on probably the most difficult problem that every entrepreneur faces. That's a pretty brave thing. How did you kind of get to the point of, of saying, this is what I want to do? Yeah, so I, uh, well, like I said, been in the corporate tech world for years uh, and lots of kind of leading, hiring, firing, managing large, large teams. And I actually had a moment a few years before I bought JobRack where I'd interviewed eight candidates in one day and they're all lovely people, but terrible interviews. And I was driving home last time, what went wrong, right? What, what was going on? And I realized actually no one's ever taught how to interview. And so off the back of that, I created an interview coaching business and we tried to scale that. So I was very much in that, you know, helping candidates, helping people kind of get, get great jobs. And then just at the point that I was kind of running out of cash and deciding that that wasn't going to be the, the, the long-term business, uh, JobRack came up for sale. And it was tiny at this point. It had been mothballed. Uh, it was doing $15.15 a month in revenue, right? So it truly had been mothballed. And it was just in a sweet spot. So I've been entrepreneurial for many years. I was in and amongst some of these communities with like kind of entrepreneurs and online business owners. And JobRack had built up a nice little name for itself. Uh, they built the custom tech, they had a good little database. And obviously, a business doing $15 a month doesn't tend to be that expensive to buy. And so it was that little kind of serendipity moment. And um, yeah, jumped in. Then was doing, obviously it was making $15 a month, so it couldn't quite support me. Uh, so I was still doing some corporate kind of uh, interim work at the same time for a couple of years just to get, you know, build things up. Um, but yeah, just that serendipity moment of, you know, this is the right thing for me to do. And, you know, remote hiring has just gone from strength to strength and then strength to strength. And then the last two years, obviously, you know, the whole world has woken up to the possibility. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I know you're working with, you started off working uh, primarily with with mostly businesses that you would consider traditionally online, but that's really changing. You were telling me, where do you kind of see the state of things with remote work and, and with businesses beginning to embrace, you know, now that we're past the crisis of, of the pandemic, where everybody was forced to think this way, how are you seeing like the trends of how people are thinking long term now about it? I think it's a fascinating time. I really do. And every now and again, I come across people that are still saying, hey, no, we're not going remote. We want everyone back in the office. Um, we want you know everyone to be close by and things like that. And we want everyone to be you know local uh, or at least within the same country. And I can have some quite robust conversations with business owners like that. And I, I respect everyone's view. 
but my what I'm seeing from my clients and the people that I work with that are really you know having incredible success is the ones that are basically leveraging opportunities to hire remotely, whether it's within the same country or across the world, to be able to hire sooner, to be able to scale faster, to be able to get better quality people. And that's a really fascinating thing. So I work with a, an SEO agency out of Boston. And a few years ago, they were hiring exclusively Harvard grads. They were working with expensive local Boston-based uh, recruiters, and they were having a tough time of it. And, you know, they're bringing these people in on pretty good salaries, very low level, you know, kind of entry level positions. But it, it was just, it was hard work for them. And then we kind of did a little trial with them. And we hired, in their case, an SEO analyst uh, out of Eastern Europe. And the quality, the work ethic just was incredible. And then the cost was the thing that made the absolute difference. And so what they were able to do is just scale quicker. So, you know, your average agency owner tends to not be able to hire until, you know, 120% of that they're at capacity, right? Until it's almost like too late, they're already annoying the customers. And it's the same for most businesses. You know, hiring is expensive um, in terms of the fees that you normally pay. It's very expensive in terms of your time because it's hard and you know, salaries can be expensive. So I think what I'm seeing is people just kind of open, waking, up, waking up and realizing the opportunities and then going, oh, well, what if I do this differently? What if, how can I make my life better? And let's be clear, right? We're working to live, not the other way around. You know, there's far too many business owners that are just working too many hours, not able to get the help and support they need, whether it's a you know, really great assistant or whether it's managers or, you know, real kind of lieutenants, as I refer to them, to help lead that business. So I think it's a fascinating time as everyone's just asking questions and trying it out. And there's some businesses that have been doing it for years, really successfully and having incredible results. And there's other businesses that are just dipping their toe in the water and trying it out. But I'm not seeing, I don't think I've seen anybody try it and then go, no, nah, this isn't for me. We're going to go back um, because, you know, the opportunities are just huge and it's a lot of fun. And um, yeah, still huge potential. So what, what are a few of the biggest advantages that are driving people towards this? So the number one advantage is just availability of the skills that business owners want. Um, if you are, as an example, if I take the you know, SEO uh, agency in Boston, or if you're an attorney and you're based out of Philadelphia, or you're an accountant and you're based in Miami, you want to find local talent. Well, it's either really, really expensive or it's just not out there. So what we've seen from this last two years with the pandemic is a lot of people have just reevaluated life and said, do I want to work five days a week? Do I want to still be doing that job? Do I want to have my own store on Etsy or eBay or whatever it might be? And so the availability of talent is the first thing, right? So there's reasons of the world that have got the skills, the experience, people that want to work really hard and you know, really commit for the long term that are actually available at rates you can afford. And that's the key thing, right? It is if you're living in somewhere, you know, kind of a first world city, cost of living is high. And so that means that salaries are very high. Um, and you may not be able to afford that as a business owner. Or if you do, it means you can hire one person. Whereas if you were paying half as much for an equally or better skilled person, well, you can hire two people or you can hire earlier. And that then lets you grow your business or get the help that you want or work less. So that's the big thing. So number one is definitely availability of the talent that people want. And then number two is definitely the, the cost and that that kind of for me, it's not about exploiting people or, you know, paying unfair kind of rates. It's about paying people well for where they live. And then, you know, the opportunity that brings for you and your business is, is pretty big. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we've, we've been able to take advantage of that both inside the U.S., you know, because we, we've been 100 percent virtual since I started the company. Um, and it was a conscious decision at the time because I wanted to be able to tap into the best people. And so we started just with hiring in other places around the U S and getting the exact talent that we needed. And that's been transformational. But then we started hiring people outside the country, which is a little bit of an adventure. I mean, it's a little bit of a, a leap of faith because I didn't have anybody at the time uh, like you who could guide me through the process, who kind of knew the ropes, but it's worked out really, really well. Have, has it been perfect? No, we had a couple of missteps along the way. Anytime you do something new, you're going to have that, but it was, you know, they weren't expensive or catastrophic mistakes by any stretch, but you know, it's allowed us to do all kinds of things like take advantage of, of shift in time zones to get work done on off hours from our core team. It's uh, certainly allowed us to get things done at a reduced cost while giving someone in a different part of the world, a really good lifestyle. 
And so everybody wins. I mean, there's just so many benefits to it. And you tap into to talent and thinking that's a little bit different. And that's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. And the time zone one, you know, I hear that lots of people have a fear about the time zone and say, well, well, don't I need them to be working exactly the same hours as me? And what we always try and do, and my big belief on this is you want ideally about, if it's full time, you want like three to four hours of crossover each day. It's like that for me is the sweet spot. And it's really easy to get that. So my speciality is Eastern Europe. It's really easy to get that with Eastern Europe. Um, and if you have that, then you have more than enough kind of time for one-to-ones and team meetings and just collaboration. But what it means is they've already done three or four hours work before you've even woken up. And so that kind of just almost like geo arbitrage, both on the financial side, but the time side of things is absolutely amazing. You know, you're kind of just getting more done. And actually what we often find, and I definitely find it with my team is they're often more productive. You know, and we see it with a lot of clients, you know, there's typically a lot of chatter in the average office, even a remote office, right? Across Slack, things like that. So actually, if you've got some of your team that are working when the rest of the office isn't awake, they get a lot more done, uh, which is really quite cool. Yeah, without a doubt. So let's talk about that a little bit, because, I mean, one of the fears going into this, you know, my, my first business, we were traditional. We had multiple offices, but everybody was in an office. And the hard part of the transition was, well, if I can't see what they're doing, how do I know that they're working? How do you deal with that with your clients? Yeah, so the first, I always love this one because I just think back to my corporate days and I think back to how many people looked like they're in the office or they were in the office and therefore it looked like they were working, but there was a lot of Facebook going on right then. And <laughs> things like that, right? There were a lot of coffee breaks getting taken, things like that. And so what we can, what it's really common is to compare and go, oh, I can't see them. Therefore, they might not be working. So the first thing is just to acknowledge that actually the people that you could see when they're in the office probably weren't working all the time either. But what we often find is that people tend to really value the ability to work remotely, to not be you know schlepping through a, a crazy commute to work and things like that. And to have some of the flexibility, a little bit of the flexibility that often comes with you know being able to work remotely or work from home. So that's the first bit. The second bit for me is, so I do use time tracking with my team, but I use it in a very particular way. I don't do anything that takes, you know, you can get these tools that take screenshots uh, of what they're working on. We don't do that. And I set a very clear expectation of why we're time tracking. So a couple of reasons for us. One is I want to know what they're working on, because what I'm generally looking at is we tend to like look at it with them maybe every few weeks or every month, because I want to look and say, well, are there some things that we should invest some money in automating? Are there some things that are taking more time than they're really worth? How can we you know, help everyone to be uh, kind of to have more interesting jobs or do more things? Personally, I, for our business, I also like to apportion it for kind of like profit tracking per client so we can see which roles are taking us you know, the most effort and how's that working. And I just say to them, I'm like, look, if you don't give me a reason to look at it, I'm not going to look at it, right? But if at some stage we think you're not working hard enough, then we're going to have a look at it and we're going to understand what's going on. So there kind of we set that really clear expectation up front so people know that we're not looking to use it as a you know, big brother type thing. And so there's a big thing about if you give people trust, 99 times out of 100, you're, they're going to you know, reward you with it. Now, the really interesting use of time tracking that we found that we've ended up doing over this last six months is stopping people working too much. So by us keeping an eye on it, it actually lets us see when someone is either just working too hard, right? And either that's because their workload is too much, which I'm not happy with. And so therefore we take steps to reduce it. Or perhaps there's a training need and things are taking them too long. And we can use that again to say, well, okay, what's going on here? Let's dig into it. And that's been really powerful. And it also tells us, oh, hang on a minute. No, they're just really busy. It's an indicator of when we need to hire. Because some people... Some people will whinge and moan as soon as they're at 60% capacity, right? Not many, but some. Some people won't let you know until they're at 150% capacity and they're flat out, burnt out, you know, they need six weeks off. You don't want to get to that stage. So we find it really useful to look and say, okay, well, what's going on? Which things can we adjust? Do we need to bring someone in? So that's the big thing for me. So one is remember that actually just because they're in an office doesn't mean they're working. And two, that actually the vast majority of people are really trustworthy want to do a good job. Um, and we make sure that we've got really good and simple employee scorecards and kind of KPIs and metrics. And we use those as part of like monthly one-to-ones to just talk through what they're doing and, you know, what are their ideas and how's it going? So we, you know, we, we know if they're kind of, if they're doing the work they should be. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think that's the key point is that most people are going to do the right thing. And most people want to do the right thing. They want to do well. Will you find the ones that don't? Yeah. But I, I don't ever really worry about it. They, they tend to surface themselves. If you yeah, spend all your time focusing on that, you tend to just get more people like that because exactly. you're not trusting. Yeah. And the big thing here is that to the people that we help uh, our clients hire are what I call team members. And so a lot of people, when they think about remote work, they think about, right, I'm getting, I'm getting someone to do tasks, right? I'm just outsourcing some tasks. It's a bit like if you're going on Fiverr or Upwork or something like that. And for me, yes, that's possible and that's fine. But if you really want to get the big benefits, you know, get someone that's going to be a team member, right? So a true member of your team, they're committing to you for the long term. You invest in them as well so that they, they feel like one of the team, right? They're invested just the same as you would if you were hiring someone locally. And so I use the word team member really intentionally because, you know, legally they are not an employee, right? Okay, almost certainly if you're hiring across borders elsewhere in the world, they're going to be self-employed. They're going to be responsible for their own kind of tax and social security. They're going to invoice you each month. So it's nice and simple. So in the US, it's like along the lines of a 1099 contractor. Um, so legally they're not an employee, but you want them to feel like an employee. And that's why I use that word team member. And again, if people are invested in you, if you're investing in them, then it kind of, like you said, you know, those people that aren't the right people kind of rise to the top pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some of the complications people run into when they're making this shift? I mean, if somebody's thinking about it, where are the kind of the potholes to avoid? Mm. So I think there's a couple of things for me. So one is being intentional about how you make them feel like part of the team, right? So if you're in an office together, you have the kind of, uh, you know, water cooler type chat in the morning, right? Or the coffee machine, or maybe you go for lunch together. But if you're remote, that doesn't happen. So you need to be a bit more intentional about it. So here at Job Rack, we do, you know, we have afternoon tea every Friday. We have half an hour. We all jump on the call. It's completely optional. And we just chat. And the only rule is there's no work chat. So, that, you know, we're intentional about that. We're very intentional about actually checking in on Slack with each other during the day and having little kind of stand-ups and things like that. So that's the first thing. Just you need to be a little bit more intentional about those um, like ad hoc type kind of moments that actually kind of help people to get to know each other. The other one is when you're building a team and you're choosing where to hire remotely, you know, there are fantastic people available from basically every corner of the globe. And some regions are better for some things than others. And there's different kind of cultural differences. What you want to avoid, if you can, is having people in every time zone, right? Because then it starts getting really complicated. You know, if you've got people in North America, Europe, Asia, Australasia, man, coordinating a team meeting, someone is getting up in the middle of the night, right? And that's just a headache and an overhead. So just try and make your life easier where you can. And then common things that people kind of expect are pitfalls that actually turn out to be really easy, communication, because you've got tools like Slack and Teams and project management tools that make that super simple. Um, Zoom, obviously, is a, is a lifesaver these days. And then making payments, again, super simple. Typically, Wise or Payoneer, really, really low fees right now, or in general, and super simple. So sometimes the things that you expect to be hard are really easy. And the things that sometimes people don't think about just takes a little bit more effort, like yeah, like being intentional about kind of spending time with each other. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's that's the key is that intentionality. So, um, and and that's the piece of this that I think a lot of people don't think about. You know, it, it's one thing you you get into this and you think, okay, well, how am I going to get them to work, and how are we going to you know get it back and measure the progress and all of that kind of thing, all of the logistics of doing the job, but. If you don't think about the human part of it, it's really hard to build that cohesive structure. And I think you you said something really important a minute or two ago about really thinking about your remote people as members of the team and not just people where you sort of throw a task over the fence and hope that they throw it back the way that you want it. You know, we tried this for a long time and we had sort of team members and we had people on the other side of the fence that we would throw tasks to. And every time we would throw the task over, you know, it was like a 50-50 whether or not we were going to get it back the way that we wanted it, right? When we switched from that and started looking at, all right, let's 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 see if we can go find people who will work with us almost like, a, you know, 
equivalent to sort of a full-time person. Maybe they're working with other people as well, but maybe we're getting half of their time or, or two thirds of their time where we're able to build that relationship. Man, it changed everything. Yeah. I talk about shower thoughts, right? So this is, uh, I have to give credit to two guys, Dan and Ian from the Tropical MBA podcast for this one. Um, And they talk about getting someone shower thoughts. And so the difference versus having someone just a few hours a week and having someone maybe 20 hours a week or full time or 20 hours a week or more is you get some of their shower thoughts. They're in the shower in the morning. They're thinking about you. They're thinking about their job, their customers, you know, what they're, they're kind of focused on. And the link to that is, you know, delegate like responsibility and outcomes, not tasks. So like as an example, like I'm working with my operations manager right now and we're working to improve our client onboarding process. And I'm a bit of a control freak, right? Standard entrepreneur, CEO, right? I suspect some people will uh, that'll resonate. And it would be really easy for me to be really hands-on and like, well, I want to improve that bit. I want to improve that bit. And I have to like sit on my hands and say, no, Let's just agree what we're looking to do. We're looking to improve the client onboarding. We want to have at least two or three wow moments that really just make our clients feel really great. And how are we going to measure it? Well, we're going to ask people to score the onboarding process. And so we want to take it from X to Y. Off you go. And there's two things that really happen there. One is I free up my time and I free up my headspace, which is huge. But the second one is actually the outcome is generally better because people then, the person that you're giving it to, so Noemi, my ops manager, she then feels like she's got more autonomy. She feels like I trust her. And then she kind of, it just generates this kind of like a virtuous circle of, you know, goodwill and actually we get way better results from it. So I get more time, I get more headspace and we get better results. So I have to remind myself continuously to right, delegate responsibility, delegate outcomes, not, you know, tasks. And, and like I said, that is where it just, the difference is huge. And I think the key thing for me is like, I want to, like I talked to my team about this, I want to pay them well and I want to expect a lot. And so I think, you know, for anyone out there that's thinking about kind of remote hiring, the first thing that people often think about is, oh, well, I could get a really low cost VA from the Philippines, for instance. And people then tend to have quite a low expectation. And I'm like, no, have a high expectation, right? Have a really high expectation for what's possible. Um, You know, don't compromise or think you need to compromise because you're hiring remotely. If you imagine the best possible person you could ever hire, let's say in the US, you should be expected to get equal or better for a lower cost. It's not about, you know, getting someone that's not as good. No, absolutely. And, And I mean, there are smart people all over the world. You know, we we tend to live in our little bubble sometimes and don't realize just the the level of talent that's available. Um, and because of cost of living differences is is also very affordable. Um, yeah. and, and that's one of the things that's been really interesting as we've done this to look at somebody who's living, you know, in a different place, different cost structures to how they live. You know, we're able to give them a really solid lifestyle and and do it without breaking the bank Mm -hmm. whereas we might not be able to do that here we we would have to hire someone lower on the the talent scale or we couldn't give them the same kind of bump in lifestyle and so you're able to hire a, a you know more of a premium level of talent just because of that difference in in cost of living yeah, which is huge. I mean, the, the costs really, the cost differences are, are absolutely massive. And one of the challenges that I face when I'm having calls with, with business owners and they'll be like, hey, I want to hire, you know, the XYZ role, whatever it might be. And then we talk about the rates and they are just so fundamentally different from hiring in the US or Canada or the UK that people are like, that can't be right, right? That's too cheap. They, they can't be any good. And it's like, no, it's just, a you know, it's considerably cheaper to live in Sarajevo in Bosnia or Belgrade in Serbia than it is in New York or London or Miami uh, or even, you know, even secondary and tertiary cities like in, in North America. So the difference is huge. And, you know, I get sometimes people worry and say, well, yeah, but isn't this kind of outsourcing jobs or offshoring jobs from, you know, our own countries? And the key thing for me is that a lot of the time, the bit or most of the time, the businesses I'm working with, they can't afford to hire locally. Or if they can afford to hire locally, they can't find the talent that's willing to work and do the role almost at any cost. 
Um, and so it's, you know, it's about enabling your business and then, you know, your business grows, you're paying more tax, you're contributing to the local economy and actually, you know, it all comes back as well. And as you said, you're helping people in, you know, some of these other countries that maybe their local opportunities aren't as good, you know, they're making a bigger difference and can we keep the kind of the whole world kind of um, spinning around. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I know you've got a, a new book out, uh, Digital Delegation. Tell us a little bit about the book. And, uh, you know, if somebody goes and grabs the, the book, what can they expect from the book? So they can expect a very short, actionable book. So when I uh, set out to write it with my co-author, uh, Esther Jacobs, and we both said the same thing. We want to help people, first of all, understand why they should hire a virtual assistant, right? Why should they have one? And second of all, we want to tell them how to do it, right? Because it is hard initially, but you, we can guide people through it. And we set out, and initially, I think my aim was I wanted it to be 50 pages because I love a short book, right? I want it to be basically long enough, but no longer, right? To tell people what they need to know. Um, so it steps you through everything around, right? What can you do with a virtual assistant? Why should you have one? Um, and the biggest thing for me that I was told this quite recently is like, basically, if you, if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. And given that assistants are typically, you know, if you hire from Eastern Europe, probably like 6 to $8 an hour, pretty sure everyone listening to this podcast, your time is worth more than 6 to $8 an hour. So if you don't have one, you are the assistant. Um, and then wanting people to do a really good job of remote hiring. Like you said, you know, we, unless you went to a better school than me and, you know, remote hiring 101 was not on my syllabus at my college or university. And so actually there is skill in doing it. It is hard, but there are certain steps you can take to massively improve your kind of success at getting the right person. Um, you know, so that's, yeah, we embarked to set out really clear, actionable book uh, and digital delegation was, uh, was kind of born as a, as a result. That's awesome. So where can people find the book? Where can they get it? Yeah, in, uh, simply head on over to Amazon. Um, we keep it down. I think it's like 99 pence in the UK, 99 cents in the US. Uh, we have an unusual approach to copyright as well. We've got copy left. We're very happy for people to re reproduce it as long as they credit it. Um, and again, because we just want to help people out. I mean, I've got a very clear and personal mission. You know, I come across way too many business owners, you know, suffering from burnout that are working too many hours, you know, not enjoying their lives kind of thing. So I want to help people. Um, and that's my big mission. So I'm kind of this year, I'm aiming to kind of help 500 business owners, like free up their time and have a better life and you know, make more profit. Um, and so, yeah, hence why I do things like digital delegation. So yeah, Amazon, uh, it's available there in ebook and um, check it out from there. And naturally that, you know, as ever, what, what some people will do is they'll, they'll read it or they'll start reading it and go, oh man, hiring's hard. I don't have time for this. And obviously naturally from there, that's where we can step in and actually help people uh, with the hiring kind of thing. And that's one of the interesting things about hiring is that if you read any like CEO books or kind of like, you know, leadership management books, you will normally see it said that hiring great people is like one of the top three things that any CEO must do. And what most people do is they take away from that and say, I need to be good at hiring. But we were never taught how to do that, right? And most of us are not doing our own bookkeeping, right? If you're, you know, Steve, I suspect most of your clients are not doing their own book editing, right? Because it's a skill. No. And what's been really interesting for me over this last few years is just educating people and saying, hey, you're right. As a CEO, as a business owner, you do need to hire great people, but you don't need to be good at the actual nuts and bolts of hiring, right? In the same way you get help with your bookkeeping or your book editing or your SEO, Hiring is one of these things that you can get help with. It's completely okay to kind of, you know, cheat your way through it kind of and just get help to get the right people from it. Yeah. It, and it is so critical. And and like anything else, you want to find somebody who's an expert at it. And that's the, you know, when you're running a business, there's all these things that have to be done and it's really hard to be an expert at all of them. And that's a, I think, mindset breakthrough for a lot of people when you start to see growth unlocked, where they start to turn to people who can, mm. who they can lean on. So for somebody to listen to this and they go, Hey, Noel's my expert now, how do they find you? And, and uh, how do they get in touch with you and find out how you can help? Yeah. Simplest way is just head on over to jobrack.eu. Uh, the site's there. We've got a ton of information there and you can, you know, there's a bunch of buttons there that you can click just to book a call with me. Um, I love having conversations with business owners. Just, you know, we can, if you know exactly what you want, great. We can talk through, you know, options on how to get it and how we could help. If you've no idea what you want and you just want to have some kind of business coaching, counseling, therapy, whatever it is you need, <laughs> we can jump on and then kind of figure out. And I do a lot of that, helping people to figure out 
right, what roles should they hire next? And actually, is it an executive assistant? Is it an operations manager? Is it a you know SEO specialist or you know whatever it is for their business? And actually helping you figure that out. And that's you know that is a lovely way for me to spend my day. So head on over to jobrack.eu, book in a call, and then we can chat through from there. Yeah, we'll link that up along with the book in the show notes. So if you're listening to this and couldn't write all that down, just look in your podcast player. It'll be in the show notes there. And uh, this has been really great. I know this is a, for a lot of people, that this is a big issue right now and they're trying to wrap their their heads around it. So I really, Noel, appreciate you coming and investing some time with me and sharing some of your experience and wisdom. Uh, I know that'll help everybody that's listening today. So Noel Andrews, uh, jobrack.eu. Thank you so much. Great to uh, great to see you again. Hey, no worries, Dave. Really great to chat. Thanks, man.